Hi, I'm Vernon L. Bowling, and welcome to another edition of Focus. As I hope you know, Focus has been on the air for over 40 years. We've been continuing to bring you the African American community problems, accomplishments, as well as successes that we've had within the African American community. Don't touch that remote. Matter of fact, you can get your pencils or papers together and write down some information that we're going to give to you that's going to be very important that you probably can use later. We'll be right back with more focus after these messages. We want to share that with our kids, that love for being outdoors, and that's what we're doing. Seeing them run around and pick up a stick and be like, look at this, Daddy. They get their little lanterns and they walk around with those and, and looking at bugs and hearing noises and wondering what everything is. I mean, that's, that's kind of what it's all about. Frankly, I didn't really know that the lottery supports natural preservation. So it's a big plus of playing. Thank you, Vernon. We have an incredible show today. I am just so excited. We're here at Sky Harbor Airport at Lincoln Ragsdale Executive Terminal, and we are going to be talking to a young man that has done incredible things in his 37 years. So with me today is Berman McGee, but also with me today is Dr. Loretta Cheeks and Lincoln Ragsdale Jr. So we have a full show, and I can't wait to get started, and we're going to start with an aviator, a philanthropist, a pilot, and an overall wonderful, wonderful man, avionics specialist, and this wonderful young man, Berman McGee. Berman, welcome to Phoenix, and thank you, thank you for coming here to do this. I am just thrilled at all of the things that you did and, and continuously do. And I say did because you started this at a very, very young age. Can you just kind of give us an update on, on you and who you are and, and why you're really here? Uh, well, thank you for inviting me out to come out to be on the show. It's, it's a great opportunity. I, I like uh, everything about aviation and anything that's on that, you know, even on the preview of uh, aviation. Um, not sure exactly where to start. Or well, I'm gonna, <laughs> well to but I'm going to say this, <laughs> that you got your pilot's license at 19 years old. 19. Now, that's, that's relatively young to, to me. Now, I have no idea what's happening in the aviation world, but 19 seems pretty young. I know a whole lot of 19-year-olds who are not really considering getting their aviation license. Uh, 19 is young. Uh, I, I chose a unique route. Uh, I, I joined the Army at the age of 17 uh, under a program called the Split Option Program where I could do my basic training between my junior and senior year of high school and, uh, and then after that you go on to your specialty. Uh, and then I had applied for flight school uh, and was accepted uh, at, at the age of 17 I was accepted into the Army flight program. So as soon as I graduated from high school and completed all the uh, primary uh, training with the Army. I went straight into the Warrant Officer Flight Program and uh, that's a two-year program in the Army and as they say the rest is, is history. It's history. <laughs> now you you said that you really became interested in um, flying when you saw uh, when you were about nine years old? I was, I was nine years old. I'll never forget. I was, I was nine years old. We were in uh, our front yard playing football, neighborhood football, and a helicopter flew over and I just remember looking up and I said, man, I wonder what it takes to fly a helicopter. And, uh, and from that point, my interest was really in helicopters, very specifically. And then um, uh, one of my uncles, he, he rented a movie, it was called Firebirds. And that just even further pushed me into, yeah, this is what I want to do. Wow, and you did and, it. And I did it. And because how many kids look at a show or look at something and say, wow, I would love to do that, and then they move on to the next show. They don't, <laughs> they don't follow up on it. Uh, it I, I, I always say that it was, it was something God-given to me uh, because that uh, once I actually started out the process, everything kind of lined up the way it should. And flight school was a breeze for me. It, it was 
it was like second nature to me. Wow. So, so that was uh, something you were supposed to do. Exactly. Now, now, you also were one of the youngest people to ever fly a Black Hawk helicopter at 23. Okay, I'm, uh, just, I'm throwing that out there. You're the youngest as far as I'm concerned. You're the youngest <laughs> person I know. Uh, I was the only say, person I know. <laughs> well, I was the youngest for the Alabama National Guard. Okay. Uh, I was the, they had never sent anyone to flight school at that at that age level uh, so they um, I, I became the youngest in the Alabama National Guard I get to fly to, Black to Hawk. fly anything oh, uh, wow, so how cool is that? Uh, and it, it's one of the darkest sides of, of, of the military I always say that you know it it came with some fighting you know some some stereotypes and but you, know. you but you did it you didn't care apparently well, I, it, it didn't, didn't it, stop it didn't bother me because i was prepared right. and i knew what to expect uh, uh my grandfather was prior military i had two older brothers that were military um and then uh you know my father was a baptist preacher so and also a businessman as well and so from that background i was taught to you know, always be prepared. There's no excuses. Uh, even if there is, you know, some type of discrimination or whatever the hurdle is, that's not your excuse. That's right. that's your motivation to, when you show up, you're 10 times better than everyone else. There you go. So that's... Now, you did something very special as a Black Hawk uh, pilot. You would be responsible for transporting the president's staff. Correct. I was on the presidential staff uh, the last two years of uh, my service in the Army. Uh, Which president was this? This was George W. Bush. Okay. The, the, we, we, used, we used to call him Little Bush. Little Bush, okay. <laughs> so uh, so uh, uh, from that time period, I, I did vari various different missions um, from doing VIP transport for ambassadors, uh, congressmen, senators, anyone that was coming into Iraq that was going out to see the troops and stuff. Uh, people don't realize that when you're in a combat zone, the way you get around is a helicopter. And, mm -hmm. you know, so they would come into Baghdad International and we would pick them up, fly them into the green zone or to wherever they needed to go. And uh, it was the most secure mode of transportation. So now let's fast forward to, uh, to now. And you are the owner, CEO of Red Tail Aviation Holding. And as the CEO of this particular company, what do you do now? What is it that you do? And, <laughs> and, and how did you get there? What do you do? It, it's, it's funny that you asked me that because some, uh, I had this conversation with one of my attorneys before because we were, he said, you're all over the place. You're doing everything and you're giving me a headache with all these <laughs> contracts I have to review. He said, he said tell him you're also hey, giving him said, a check. He so said, what please. do you do? He, <laughs> I, I said, think of me as an aviation engineer. I said, it doesn't exist, but that's the best way of thinking of it. I, I look for different things that are not there, and I create the path for it to be able to, to wow. be there. So, But let me ask you a question, because I'm, I, I have to add philanthropists to your, uh, to your titles, to your many titles. It's now you have to tell your lawyer you just added something else to that. <laughs> You're giving back. And... I'm blessed to be the recipient of your giving back because you are allowing us to take our rights of passage girls to Ghana, West Africa in July. You paid for their tickets and I say thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that. What motivates you to, to do something like that? And thank God you're able to do something like that. But what, what motivates you to do something like that? Um, it's. I come from a very strong Christian background. As I said, my dad's a, a Baptist pastor. So I learned very early on about charity and giving and tithing and things like that. So it goes back. I do the same thing on the on the business side. I look at it as uh, how can I help someone else to further what they're doing or open up doors that they would otherwise not have an opportunity. So with with youth, especially uh, young minority youth, it's, it's lacking that they can even fathom outside their state, let alone the entire country. So this was an opportunity also for me to be able to do something uh, for that 
uh, that that matches up with with what I feel is the right thing to do. Well, you you have blessed us all, and I truly appreciate and thank you. And we are currently sitting in a Citation Latitude airplane. And uh, one of the airplanes that you fly is not necessarily this one, but it's one of the, the, the planes that you fly. And when we come back, we're going to be talking to Dr. L Loretta Cheeks, who's going to give us a little bit more insight on the beautiful donation that Mr. McGee has blessed us with. So come back so you can hear more about what's happening. Little things that might seem simple could have such a big impact. I'm putting my effort towards an outcome. You have to put effort into it to be part of a community. When you play the lottery, your money stays here in Arizona. It actually goes back to your community. You're helping out your state. Welcome back to Focus, I'm Fatima Halim, and we are currently at the Sky Harbor Airport at the Lincoln Ragsdale Executive Terminal. And we're sitting in a Citation Latitude airplane with Dr. Mm -hmm. Loretta Cheeks, who is a computer scientist, and you got your start in aviation, didn't you? A little bit. I came to Arizona to work in aviation with Honeywell. Okay, what did you do? I modernized a scheduling algorithm for Honeywell, which the aircraft b is based on events, and I mod modernized the scheduling algorithm of those events that happen on the aircraft. Okay, we have no idea what she's talking <laughs> about, but we're really impressed anyway. <laughs> so, so Loretta, now, now, you're no longer doing avionics. Correct. And you're doing other things now. You're doing some wonderful things with your program, with your STEM program. Yes. But tell, tell, let's talk about that a little bit. Sure. Uh, as part of my giving back to the community, I decided to start a nonprofit. And with that nonprofit, my whole intent is to introduce and engage youth in STEM, particularly in computer science, because computer science and information technology is one of the fastest growing segments of industry period for getting a career and gaining employment and so me as an african-american woman with where there are so few of us i wanted to make sure that i give our youth a way to actually um, a lens into my world that is culturally relevant and uh, contextualized where they can easily understand the, some N now you were my link mm -hmm. to Berman. We just met Berman McGee, who is an incredible young man, yes, young man yes. doing so many wonderful things in his youth. How did you get that connection? And thank you, I'm not even gonna ask you why you chose me, because my mother always said, never look a gift horse in the mouth. And I am not gonna question you. I just say thank you, but how did you make that connection? Well, it goes back to my name. The name of my organization is called Strong Ties. Mm -hmm. One of the things in social science and networks, which I study as a researcher, is understanding strong ties, like my tie with you, mm -hmm. I know you, and also valuing weak ties. Mm -hmm. It's through a relationship, which is a weak tie, that I became known to Berman. I knew someone, and they actually knew me, and some of the work I was doing with you, and they reached out to me after my event that I had in during Black History Month called Turn Up for Steam. Right. Through this that week. our children participate. Our girls that, that's and right. Boys and all, the in. entire mm -hmm. cohort of Rites of Passage and the Sons program participated right. in this event in February. Exactly. Through that relationship, which is a weak tie, became a strong tie. And I met. Berman through that weak tie relationship. Now when you say weak tie, what do you mean? Okay, so some relationships that we have, we know the degree. I can touch you, I can call you. Some people you may know, you necessarily may not touch base with them. You don't, they're not in your inner circle, mm -hmm. but they're still valuable relationships. Absolutely. And so that was, that's, what, that's what's considered a weak tie and a strong tie. It's no, no weight on the the person, it's just the type of relationship and respecting different relationships. Mm -hmm. And through that introduction, 
this person, um, which is Berman's cousin, said that my cousin uh, really would like to do a goodwill. I love what you're doing, and I want him to meet you. Wow. And through that relationship, I, of course, reached out to you and told you about this great work. Because we have a strong tie. Because we have a strong <laughs> tie, and it was very seamless. And very, um, it was just the right thing to do. And we're still working on that. That's exciting. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we'll be going to Ghana, West Africa. That's right. On July 4th through the, through the 19th. That's right. We're taking about 15 girls, and we're taking the uh, some of the women who have volunteered in our Rice of Pastors program, as well as Dr. Uh, Akua Anoshe, who is going to be helping to facilitate that uh, the trip to Ghana once we get there, along with Angelica Ali, who's going to be also helping to facilitate because she has family in Ghana, right? That's correct. What are we going to be doing? I think it's so important that we tell our community what our girls will be doing because this is a STEM trip. STEM, or actually we say, we're calling it STEAM now, which is science, technology, engineering, um, arts, and mathematics. Correct. Right? What will our girls be doing when we get to Ghana? Sure. Uh, when our girls go to Ghana, we're probably going to be working in two different states. Mm -hmm. We're going to be we're going to Accra, Accra and Kumasi, Kumasi. Mm -hmm. and we're working on projects. One project is a solar water purification project. Well, we'll actually map where the resources for water is. Because water is hard to get. Water yeah, is very hard to get, right. and 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 you can imagine a mother really, and usually it's the women who are carrying, or the children mm -hmm. who are carrying the weight of getting water to and from their and, villages and on their head, the right? Big old barrels exactly. of water that Can they Exactly. Can you carry. imagine getting to a location and not knowing that that water is no longer available because you, it only gives out so much? Right. So what we're doing is actually mapping through a collaborative effort. We're mapping where the resources are and also through a, a mobile application, we'll be able to project what resources are available. And our girls, our rights of passage, our Blueprint for Womanhood girls will be doing this. That's correct. I'm so excited. Exactly. And that's that, one of the projects. That's one of the, what's the second project? The second project is an e-textile project. Just imagine fashion and technology. So our students will actually build out circuitry that they will sew on fabric, particularly kente cloth. Wow. Right? And so as we, and we will be visiting a Kente cloth maker, village, yeah. village, right? Yeah, the Kente village. And so this is very relevant. This is very important, particularly in terms of potential, because uh, Ghana, like many African uh, countries, actually load share their energy. Meaning that there's a 24-hour blackout. There's a 24-hour blackout. In this country. Not every day, but, but maybe twice, three Sure, and Times and of week. course we know that light provides safety. Mm -hmm. So providing it, uh, LEDs on someone's personal, oh. that that would be a safety, uh, something that the a whole village's potential and, and, and impact. Not safety, just light. I mean, light. I've I've gone through. I've been to Ghana a couple of times, and and I've been part. I've participated. Well, I shouldn't participate. I can help, but be part of sure. the the blackouts. And it's dark. I mean, it, it, when they say blackout, they really mean blackout. So I, I, I think that that's such an incredible idea and such a wonderful resource for the people. And the girls will be doing this in conjunction with or in collaboration with Ghanaian girls. That's correct. They'll be doing it with them. So it won't be done in a, a vacuum. Or and void. May I say this? This effort is so collaborative. We have people pitching in. And I just want to say with the e-textiles, NASA actually gave us the e-textile kits, and which is amazing because I came back to NASA, I'm a D NASA data not, and I came back to NASA and say, how can you help me? We're taking our girls, we can't use Wi-Fi, we're not going to be in American schools, we ain't gonna be we're not going to be plugging anything in, forget about my computers that I thought I would bring there, what can we do? And they said, we'll send you the e-kits that we use, and they're called Blink Blink, and, uh, and yes, so they sent us oh, valuable e-kits, lots of them. Oh, that's exciting. So now we're going, not only are we going to be doing these two particular projects in Accra and Kumasi, but we're also going to be making certain that the girls go to some of the historic mm -hmm. locations, Cape mm -hmm. Coast, etc., and they're going to the cultural village. They'll be doing a lot of un other wonderful things. They will also be learning dance as well as teaching some of their dances. So that's going to be so much fun. I'm so excited about that. And that's very important because people don't understand the significance of art. Why is art in STEM? 
art is in STEM because in order for you to create anything, an app, any software, you have to have your creative, your creative uh, brain cells or even your juices, you have to have those unlocked. And the, being able to express in the dance, the improvisation that we do naturally through dance, through different expressions, that allows students to express and also think about things in different ways. Yeah. And then they can take their ideas and then launch them to digital platforms in such ways. I, I'm very excited. I'm so excited. Thank you so much for coming and thank you for turning us on. And I'm so glad that we have a strong tie. Yes. And this is Loretta, Dr. Loretta Cheeks with Strong Ties. And, and congratulations on your doctorate. Thank really, you very this much. Is wonderful. When we come back, we're going to be talking to Lincoln Ragsdale Jr., who's the son of the man who this particular executive terminal is named after. So please come back when Focus continues. Little things that might seem simple could have such a big impact. I'm putting my effort towards an outcome. You have to put effort into it to be part of a community. When you play the lottery, your money stays here in Arizona. It actually goes back to your community. You're helping out your state. So relaxed in this citation latitude. I think I'll buy it. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to Focus. I'm Fatima Halim, and I am at, actually, I'm at Sky Harbor Airport in the Lincoln Ragsdale Executive Terminal. And we're here with Lincoln Ragsdale Jr. Welcome, welcome, and thank you so much for coming. I am just so excited that you're here with us because you, well, your father is the reason why this terminal is called the Lincoln Ragsdale Junior Senior Terminal, right? Right. So you are also a pilot. Yes. So let's talk about that. When, when did you get your license? I got my license right out of high school. When I finished up high school, there's a school um, in Douglas, Arizona called Cochise College. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I graduated in May, my dad had enrolled me to go to Cochise College um, in Douglas, Arizona. And so I started my aviation career when I was 18. So is your father wanted you to fly or is this something that you wanted to do? Well, you know, I've been in the airplane experience ever since a child because since he had the plane, that's how we'd get around. And so, you know, he'd just throw us in the airplane and we'd fly off somewhere. So since we had a plane, I wanted to learn how to fly the plane because I didn't want to have a plane and not be able to know how to fly it. Uh, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So now your father, we have to say that your father was uh, a, a Tuskegee Airman. Now, how was that growing up with a father who was a Tuskegee Airman? Because uh, your father was an icon in our community. He was really an icon here in Phoenix. Wonderful man. Also philanthropist, as are you. And how was it growing up with, with him? Well... You know, during that time, it was in the, you know, 60s, and so it was a lot of uh, integration issues, and since my father was a Tuskegee Airman, and he grew up in Oklahoma during the, he was born in 1926, mm -hmm. so he, his, his youth was during the time of the Depression, and then it was a very Jim Crow state, Oklahoma was. So in that experience, he was always taught, you know, that he wasn't anybody, he wasn't important until he went into the service. He said the service at the Tus being in the Tuskegee Institute and being a pilot was one of the most inspirational experiences he ever had because it taught him that he was somebody and that by being somebody, he could do whatever he wanted to. And so what, by flying an airplane, you're as free as you can be as a human being in, in any environment and so that's why he loved to fly so as soon as he uh, finished his program they sent him out to Luke Air Force Base to integrate Luke Air Force Base as an experiment in 1946 mm -hmm. and so in, in that he loved Arizona it was dry it wasn't humid no hurricanes so he decided he would uh, stay here after after um, being in the uh, in and the he, experiment as and a became, a, Airman. became a very successful businessman well, he was in the funeral home business. He was 
Well, you uh, can't go wrong there. Yeah, can you? Well, you, you can, <laughs> but we were, uh, he was um, fourth generation, third generation. I would be fourth generation. So we, and, we and started. you're still doing that? I'm not doing mortuary work anymore. No, you no, just. I got into real estate. No, uh, you're in the real estate now. Yeah, okay, estate, but you're yes. still a successful businessman, so you, you're following in the footsteps of your father. Yes, I'm a pilot. I'm a, I'm you a fly, private you pilot. Fly, you have your own plane right now. Right, right. I, I fly a small. Um, what they call a bonanza, a single engine holds uh, four people. Okay, one, uh, two. We got Loretta. We got. So when we where we going? Where, where we going next? Well, that's <laughs> Sedona. That sounds good to me. So w what is that like? You said there's this feeling of being free. I, I hear that from a lot of folks who fly. Mm. The thing I think about flying, it's, 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 it's hard to describe. Because you know you're like in the air, you're like a bird, and you're you're as free as you can be. You can go as fast as your plane can take you, wow. and when you're in those smaller airplanes, and um, I I can't really verbalize it right now. I have to it's think just, about that for a it, minute. Well, gosh, you just you don't have to. I see your face, <laughs> and in your face is this love and this freedom. That that sounds wonderful. Well, I don't fly, but I certainly would love to learn how to fly. So what would you say to someone who is older, who might say, okay, is it too late to get my pilot's license? Is it too late for It's me? never too late, as long as you can pass the physical. I can pass it. What, what do they do? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I can pass the physical. Yeah, well, what, no, well, you know, just make sure your heart's beating and things like that. Oh, but, you know, it's not like you have to do push-ups or anything like no, that. I no, might be, I might be able to do the push-ups more than anything else. <laughs> No, they want to make sure you know you can see and and uh, oh well then you know, there, and there there it goes. Yeah, no, you can wear glasses and all the <laughs> things, but um, yeah, they just want to make sure that you won't you know pass out behind the behind the uh, okay. plane. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think that um, flying is in my future. Well, at least me flying the plane, but a lot of flying is definitely in my future. And I truly appreciate you being here with us today. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much for everything that you continuously do in our community. And thank you all for joining us on Focus. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for another edition of Focus. And if you'd like to contact us, if there's a topic you'd like to see us present or someone you'd like us to talk to, the information is right up on the screen. We'll see you next week, same station, same time, when Focus continues.